The title of my talk today is Building Toy Models for Quantum Gravity with Cold Atoms. And I thought I would start with um, a little bit of kind of my perspective on uh, what is the motivation behind this emerging field of quantum gravity in the lab. I can actually imagine um, there are a number of different motivations. If you're a theorist, um, maybe your motivation is particularly about understanding quantum gravity, hoping that um, maybe by building some model systems in the lab, we can get new insight into deep questions like what happens to information in black holes? Is gravity an emergent phenomenon that really comes from microscopic quantum mechanical degrees of freedom? Um, as an experimentalist um, and perhaps a, a quantum engineer, I'm also somewhat motivated um, by the fact that I know very well that something that's really crucial in any sort of effort at quantum engineering is being able to sort of visualize the systems that we're trying to make. Um, so, so much of my intuition about quantum mechanics comes from pictures, um, you know, interference fringes, um, uh, pictures of, of quantum noise. There are certain types of quantum states um, that I know how to think about visually, but they're fairly simple, right? Um, single particle quantum mechanics I can think about in terms of interference fringes. Some simple entangled states I can um, still visualize with some kind of a picture like I've drawn here. But sort of once you get to trying to explore like the exponentially large Hilbert space of many body quantum mechanics, we don't even know how to, how to start thinking about things in pictures. Um, at least I certainly didn't until I started to hear um, about this idea of holographic duality that um, for certain strongly interacting quantum many body systems, um, there's really a way of visualizing the structure of entanglement as giving rise to space-time curvature and in terms of uh, space-time curvature and gravity in a higher dimension. Um, so that's at least a beautiful and elegant picture. Um, and uh, you know, as an experimentalist, I, I'd love to know, um, you know, are there model systems we could build in a lab that would allow us to sort of probe this type of emergent geometry? Um, uh, uh, could one ultimately? Um, identify a geometrical picture by some experimental probes, um, even if it's not a priori known. Um, and in cases where there is some simple holographic description, um, can building models of that kind, could those be a starting point for having ways of visualizing entanglement in ever more complex many body systems? So those are um, kind of the, the dreams. Um, so, um, if we'd like to start with something that has a simple description on the gravity side, what could be simpler than a black hole? Um, so, <laughs> so, um, so that, could we, uh, as a starting point, we might aspire to build um, a black hole in the lab. And the, a black hole, um, I'm told, I should think of as a maximally chaotic quantum many-body system, um, where the key signature is that if you were to sort of encode information in one qubit, it would exponentially quickly become delocalized over all degrees of freedom in the system. It would be what's called a, a fast scrambler. Um, so uh, that, this is a nice concrete prediction that um, uh, a concrete signature that one ought to be able to sort of test for in experiments um, to check, is, is it possible that this thing we have in the lab might be a black hole? So um, what would it take to start to build these types of um, um, systems in the lab? Well, um, the key thing that you need, right, if you want information to spread exponentially quickly across all degrees of freedom, um, one thing that you don't want is to have interactions of the type you usually find in nature, actually, that decay with distance, right? Um, if I just have sort of nearest neighbor interactions in some spin chain, the time for information to spread will, will grow linearly with system size. Um, so the question is, are there systems one could build where that sense of um, uh, lo locality um, breaks down or where information somehow can spread exponentially quickly. And um, the toy model, one or a, a solvable model um, that we can take as inspiration that you've heard about already some, uh, in some talks today is this Sastevye Kataev model, which has uh, particles, fermions that can hop in a way that is completely non local. Um, uh, and you heard about some sort of condensed matter uh, models that might be able to realize this. Um, I have this dream of being able to do something like this um, maybe in a controlled system of, of cold atoms. Um, now, the atoms themselves are never going to hop in a way that is non-local. Um, but what I will talk about today is a system 
where um, the particles that will hop um, will be spin excitations. Okay, so I'll think of spin down as an empty site and spin up as an occupied site. Um, and so if I can generate some sort of a um, spin exchange interaction where up and down uh, uh, flip their places, that would be a particle hopping. Um, and what we'll be able to do is actually to make that process happen in a way that is mediated by photons. And because photons travel, um, for my purposes in, on laboratory scales instantaneously, this will be effectively a non-local type of an interaction. So um, again, so conceptually what I'd like to do right, um, is have a situation where initially I have a spin excitation in this atom on the left. And um, by turning on light, I'm going to, I, what I'd like to do is actually convert that spin excitation into a photon that can travel to this other atom and um, uh, uh, get converted back there into another spin excitation that has now moved. Um, that's a nice idea. Uh, if I just had two atoms in free space, the chance that my photon would um, go from one to the other is low. But we can enhance that probability by putting the atoms in an optical resonator. Um, and this is going to be the general approach to making um, non-local uh, uh, interactions mediated by light. OK. So this idea of having photons mediate interactions among cold atoms um, is one that has already been explored in a couple of contexts, one using these non-local interactions as a uh, resource for generating entangled states, um, and also for sort of more condensed matter-inspired quantum simulations. Our goal will be to use them and, and probe quantum dynamics. Right? Um, ultimately, we'd like to be able to have the tools to, to um, test how information is scrambled in the system. Um, so the key ingredient will be having non-local interactions um, but sort of local observation of these spin dynamics. So the experimental setup looks something like this. Um, essentially, we have uh, laser-cooled atoms that we trap optically in a standing wave of light um, in between two mirrors. Um, that's what it looks like in, in reality. There's a window below through which we can take pictures of the atoms um, where they are or also what spin state they're in. And so. Uh, so we'd like to see what the spin excitations do um, under the influence of some, some interactions that we engineer. Um, and so in particular, we um, set the system up so that the interactions that we can make will be optically controlled. So the system is non-interacting. The atoms, I, I should mention, are always pinned spatially. Um, the dynamics will be purely in the spin degree of freedom. The system will be non-interacting until we turn on some laser, um, which will drive a process where an atom can absorb a photon. Uh, and re-emit it into this resonator, flipping its spin, and another atom will absorb that photon and uh, flip its spin in turn. OK. Um, and because it's optically controlled, that means you can easily um, sort of turn interactions suddenly on or off, maybe control some things about the, the sign of the interaction by the frequency of the laser field. So this, this will give us some, some neat nods. OK. So um, here's an experiment where we've um, done this. So what am I showing here? So I, uh, let me actually take a step back. So we have this cloud of atoms that's a few hundred uh, microns long, or order a millimeter long. And I'll show you pictures where each row represents, essentially, um, the spin texture in that cloud of atoms. So in this case, um, uh, the brighter colors are indicating spin excitations um, at some position in the cloud. And the, the vertical direction is time. Here we've sort of generated some spin excitations at t equals 0. At t equals 0, we turn on the light, and we watch where they go. Um, and you'll see that uh, they show up over here at some later time. Um, if you take cuts versus time, you see some oscillations indicating there's um, uh, the spins excitations are kind of coherently oscillating between different regions of the cloud. Um, and you might ask, why did they suddenly show up over here? Right? They didn't just sort of like travel continuously from A to B or diffuse outwards. They suddenly jumped. Um, and we can actually understand that. Um, it turns out the reason this happened in this particular experiment has to do with the strength of the atom-light interaction as a function of position. In this particular experiment, the interactions are strongest over here. And they immediately jump, jump to where the excitations jump to where the atom-light interaction is strongest. OK. This is a, so actually, it turns out we can understand these dynamics quite well in a simple mean field model. Ultimately, we'd like to get um, to uh, um, perhaps being able to um, not simply have interactions that are dictated by where the light intensity is strongest, um, but that we can actually start to program and start to explore how does the structure of these non-local interactions or the form of these non-local interactions um, uh, influence the dynamics of quantum information? And is there a way that we can engineer them, for example, to build a fast scrambler? Okay. Um, 
So actually, so, so my dream is to have like a function generator where I can plug in. I'd like to study the spin model today. Um, but some of the sort of knobs or buttons you might like would be um, the form of the spin interactions. Do they just hop? That would be described by this term I call JXY. Or is there also a long range interaction? That would be described by this term I call JZ between the spin excitations. Um, maybe you want to control the sign of the interaction or the spatial structure. Do they all talk to each other? Um, or or is, is the spatial structure more complex? Um, so we started actually um, brainstorming a bit with our theory friends about which knob they wanted us to start to turn. <laughs> um, and it was. Um, and, and the first thing you can ask is actually, how do we get beyond, um, how do we start to introduce chaos into the system? Because um, the key ingredient for, the, for our scrambling information is, is chaos. Um, so actually, our collaborator, Ehud Altman, um, started to look at what is actually the kind of dynamical phase diagram of the simplest class of model that we naturally realize in these experiments, which is one where there's potentially some, um, uh, there's an all to all interaction. Um, it has some form of disorder because the couplings of individual spins to the light um, are not equal. Um, and it turns out that that um, is already actually a rather rich phase diagram that has regions. It, it's not a fast scrambler, um, but it does have regions where it starts to be chaotic. So it's a first step um, in terms of having a model where one can explore interplay of non-local interactions and chaos. And, um, the knob that you need, though, to start to actually access uh, chaos in the system is the ability to have not just spin excitations hopping, not, um, but also some long range interaction, which is this term I call JZ. Um, so you'd like to be able, ideally, to tune um, the form of these spin spin interactions. And it turns out that's actually that knob is one we have in our system. Um, it's simply essentially the orientation of a magnetic field relative to the axis of this resonator. And so um, we've recently shown just by sort of Continuously tuning the angle of the magnetic field, we can continuously tune um, the form of the non-local spin model that we realize. Um, and that's a first step towards starting to explore uh, this, this phase diagram. OK, so just to give you kind of a flavor of how, how these experiments work, let me just illustrate, actually, um, in this particular example, how did we measure, let's say, this, this Ising interaction. Um, so a typical type of experiment we do is we initialize the system with some sort of a um, we can locally control the magnetization of the system. So for example, in this case, we have these spins here pointing in the minus z direction. Those are the ones in green. We have some other spins that are pointing somewhere in the xy plane. Um, and it turn, if I have an Ising interaction, what I expect to happen is actually that um, the, the spins that point along z act as sort of an effective z field about which other spins process. Um, and so by looking at the dynamics versus time, so again, this, um, uh, which I've indicated here as the phase of the spin precession, um, you can actually extract how strong is this Ising interaction and also how strong is it as a function of position in the cloud. Um, okay, so I indicated here um, something about the orientation of the spins in a color plot. Um, I find colors a bit hard to read, so we can also make a little animation. So um, this is kind of locally what the magnetization of the system is doing. Um, and one nice thing we can do, so we can tune with the magnetic field, the form of the spin-spin interaction. We can also tune actually with a laser frequency um, the red case um, is we can tune the sign of the interaction. Is it ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic? That turns out to just be a laser frequency. Um, and so uh, uh, one of the kind of cute things you can see here is just by switching the laser frequency, I can make the, um, the I can see from the dynamics that the sign of the interaction is opposite in the two cases. And this actually turns out to be one ingredient um, that is something you'd like in your toolbox for probing um, scrambling. So what do I mean by that? Um, this idea of, uh, of information scrambling is something about um, watching, asking how a simple operation like a local spin rotation becomes more complex as a function of time due to the influence of interactions in a many body system. Um, so um, uh, what would be nice to be able to do would be to say, um, I, I can either just simply perform a local perturbation or I can do something like um, implement the time evolved operation, right? Um, which would be uh, uh, something where I um, evolve the system under a Hamiltonian H, and then later switch the sign and evolve under minus H. Um, that ability to have, if I have a pure spin model, the ability to switch the sign of the interaction is precisely sort of the trick you need to be able to watch how an operator grows in complexity. And so the, this, these are um, this ability to locally rotate the spins, and then combining that with the switchable sign interaction 
um, is something we would like to put together to start to sort of watch how operators grow. Um, you can kind of think of this. This is kind of one of a set of different techniques that have been, um, in some cases, demonstrated and, or at least proposed for asking about how you can actually experimentally measure this process of information scrambling. So the example I just gave is kind of inspired by the classical notion of chaos as being about sensitivity to perturbations. If I went back in time right, by evolving under minus h and let a butterfly flap its win wings and then evolve back forward to today, is there a tornado because the butterfly flapped its wings? That's kind of like what that's getting at. Um, there are a couple of other sort of classes of protocols um, that could potentially be implemented. Um, one is sort of the in inspired by the notion of chaos as a sensitivity to initial conditions. So, um, so quantum mechanically, um, there's the, the version of this that you can think about is, if you were to prepare many different initial quantum states and watch how they evolve, can you learn something about how chaotic the system is? Um, and Xiaoyang Qi, who I think is in the audience, um, uh, has pointed out that you can actually quantitatively, by protocols that involve simply preparing a number of different initial states, letting them evolve, and then essentially taking a picture of the magnetization, um, if you do that enough times and gather statistics, you can quantitatively say something about how large an operator has grown um, as a function of the evolution time. Um, so there, the key ingredient is the ability to sort of locally prepare a particular spin texture and perform this spin-sensitive imaging. So that's also something that we're kind of starting to have the, the tools to hopefully do. And then there's a third class of approaches that I think you'll hear more about, particularly experiments, experiments along these lines tomorrow. Um, but you've already um, heard this, this idea mentioned today. The third class of approaches involves um, teleporting information through a wormhole. And so um, the key resource, so I'm kind of indicating here what are the resources for these different ways of probing information scrambling. For um, teleportation, the key resource is uh, the thermofield double state that you've heard a few people talk about today, um, which is something where uh, I have sort of two copies of a quantum system. And each one by itself appears to be in a thermal state. But if I look at the entire thing together, it's actually pure. Um, so. Uh, we kind of were you know, focusing on building up the toolbox for these first two. But we happen to realize there's a very, the simplest, most elementary example of a thermofield double state is actually something we also potentially have access to in our lab. I haven't quite figured out whether it's useful, but if somebody in the audience knows, um, that would be good. So, so let me just illustrate this. So um, the atoms that we work with, um, I've kind of been talking about them as having two states spin up and spin down. But the reality is they actually have three states. I'll call them minus 1, 0, and 1. And it turns out that if you start with all the atoms in the zero state, okay, and you turn on um, this, this kind of spin exchange interaction that flips one spin up when it flips another one down, um, the, what, you, what you get is that you can have processes where you take two zero atoms and create a plus one and a minus one atom together. Okay, so um, we can do this. We can start with all the atoms in the zero state and turn on the light in our experiment. Um, and uh, this is just 100 repetitions of the same experiment. You'll see sometimes there are um, atoms in the minus one state and the plus one state, sometimes not. Um, so there are large fluctuations here in what's in these, this plus one and this minus one mode, but they always kind of seem to be correlated. Um, again, this is just looking at a fixed time in different repetitions of the same experiment. But if you look as a function of time, this population in these plus and minus one states is something that grows exponentially. And it's actually something you can understand by modeling this system um, these three internal states, right? I have this extended atomic system with three internal states. If I think of these as, I can actually think of these as three modes, like three harmonic oscillator modes into which I can put excitations. Um, and if I sort of work in the right basis, you can actually see that there's a way of thinking of this as actually two unstable oscillators. Um, they're unstable, like, they're, like it's an inverted um, harmonic potential. That's why the population grows exponentially. Um, but this isn't a basis where um, but in, in the original basis of these A and B modes, actually, um, the state that I get out is entangled. And actually, um, at least theoretically, the form of this um, is some uh, uh, thermofield double state with a sort of an effective temperature that depends on the evolution time. So that's kind of intriguing. Um, now, you know, this is not a wormhole. This is <laughs> um, there's no gravity here. This is an entangled state of um, two harmonic oscillators. Um, but 
it, I think it's an interesting question whether this is a starting point for, for doing something a little bit fancier and starting to explore these um, teleportation protocols. And in particular, um, the reason I suspect it might be a starting point for doing something interesting is, yes, I can think of it as two harmonic oscillators, but I've simplified things down a lot when I gave you that picture, because really this is a spatially extended system um, of many, many atoms. And so um, uh, you can start to ask, you know, what does it take to sort of really benefit from the spatial extent of the system? I have optical control of the interactions. I have access to those spatial degrees of freedom and images. Um, and so maybe if we can go beyond physics that we can describe by this kind of single spatial mode picture, um, uh, this, this really is useful for asking about um, uh, many body physics and, and also chaotic dynamics. So we've been actually starting to explore a little bit to what extent is this system of um, many atoms non-locally interacting with the cavity, something that I should think of as just because I have a single cavity mode, sort of a big single particle that I can think of as a single spin. I'm going back now to spin language, um, versus something that where really the spatial degree of freedom it plays a role. Um, so just to give one example of this, um, if I have this a system where each atom has exactly the same coupling to the cavity mode, um, uh, I can sort of, and actually, even if there are different couplings, perhaps, I can write sort of the, the types of interactions I get in terms of some sort of a large spin that's sort of a weighted sum of the individual spins that I called SZI here. And in that limit where I sort of think of this as a single big spin, it turns out that, for example, if I have um, a pure Ising interaction of the type I showed you before, I could write my Hamiltonian. Um, in terms of that big, big, in terms of just that big spin, um, if I had purely spin exchange interactions, I could write my Hamiltonian in terms of the x and y components of that big spin. Um, and actually, uh, I, I can actually almost equate these two forms of interaction to each other up to something that, if the total spin were conserved, would just be a constant. And and so there's there are certain predictions you might have if you take this this picture of thinking of this as a single big spin about, for example, expecting to see a symmetry in the dynamics depending whether I, uh, that doesn't care whether I have, let's say, anti-ferromagnetic Ising interaction or a ferromagnetic XY interaction. And there are certain measurements we do that sort of display that symmetry. Um, so this is, I won't go into details, but this is some kind of a susceptibility measurement that we um, perform after preparing kind of a low energy state of either the Ising or the spin exchange Hamiltonian. And that's an indication that so far things are kind of well described by this rather boring picture of a single big spin. Um, but it, so, you, so we started to ask the question, can we go to these um, regimes that look sort of identical um, if I think of the system as a single big spin? And are there ways that we actually can start to see a difference and start to see the many body aspect of this spatially extended system playing a role? Um, and just to give one concrete example, if you subject the system to um, an inhomogeneous magnetic field so that the positions of the atoms actually start to play a role. Um, like as a function of time, if there are no interactions, you start to see the spins. Um, this is in color indicates phase, so there's a spatial winding of the phase. Um, and then you ask what happens if you turn on interactions. Um, there are actually dramatically different behaviors depending whether I have um, the spin exchange interaction of one sign or the Ising interaction of the other. Um, and in particular, these um, spin exchange interactions um, protect the spin coherence, they actually prevent the spins from dephasing in a way that the Ising interactions don't. Um, and so this is just the first illustration of starting to actually really look at the spatial structure um, and uh, uh, exploit the spatial inhomogeneity to start to go beyond the, to, to a regime that I really cannot describe in terms of a single, single big spin and really need to think about the individual degrees of freedom. Um, OK, so somewhat ironically, uh, in, in sort of asking about what knobs we need to maybe build a system that will scramble, we stumbled upon a way of actually enhancing the coherence of the system rather than, <laughs> rather than scrambling information. Um, but coming back to sort of the, the goal, you can ask, what can we do now? Um, we see that you know, the spatial degrees of freedom matter, but can we start to get more control over the way in which they matter in such a way that we could, could turn this into a fast scrambler? And so there's a general approach um, that uh, looks potentially very powerful. And the, the sort of the dream would be to have a situation where we have, um, so far I've been showing you this spatially extended cloud of atoms. Um, but uh, at some point soon, we could also 
place them into an array that I can think of as more of a lattice model. You saw beautiful pictures of arrays of atoms in a talk earlier today. And the question is, is there some way that you could start to really then engineer the spatial structure of these non-local couplings um, in a way that you can control with a laser field? And one way that you can start to do that um, is, for example, apply a magnetic field gradient across the system, a little bit like we had on the previous slide. Um, and now, um, if I have a magnetic field gradient, I can no longer have spin excitations hop over arbitrary distances. The magnetic field gradient sort of looks like a tilted potential for these spin excitations. Um, uh, hopping does not conserve energy. Um, so, or, or in other words, flip-flopping doesn't conserve energy if there's a magnetic field gradient. But if you can actually bridge sort of the energy cost of a flip-flop at a particular distance by um, turning on more than one frequency of laser light, and particularly if I sort of turn on you know, two frequencies, that match the energy cost of a flip-flop at some distance, I should be able to controllably turn on interactions at a particular distance. And it turns out, actually, for us um, in the lab, kind of um, controlling the frequency spectrum of a laser field is, is easy. Um, and so in principle, that could turn into a very versatile way of controlling the spatial structure of the hoppings in the Hamiltonian um, in, in, a, in a programmable way. OK, so the kind of first evidence that this works um, is from looking at that process I showed you before, that pair creation process, where we start with um, these atoms in the zero state and make plus and minus one atoms. Um, we find that sort of the distance at which those plus and, one, min, one, plus and minus one atoms can appear, um, uh, if we sort of turn on a magnetic field gradient, they can appear at a distance that is set by having these two frequencies present in our laser field. And we want to extend this into something where one can have um, uh, more versatile control and start to really pattern in the structure of the couplings. And then you could ask, what would you dream to do um, in order to build a fast scrambler? And um, a toy model that we've started to think about is one where you say, I, I'd like reasonably efficiently to be able to kind of spread information on all length scales, um, reasonably efficiently in terms of the you know, number of laser frequencies I need, perhaps. So inspired by that, we asked the question, suppose you just had um, you know, a, a system where you can hop to nearest neighbor sites, but also to fourth and eighth and sixteenth neighbor sites, powers of two distances, let's say. So I don't need that many laser frequencies, and I would be able to bridge a y uh, uh, to, to efficiently maybe spread information kind of on all length scales. What would this kind of a model do, right? So you could dream of doing that with just a, a function generator. Um, actually, so I'll imagine that I have this structure of couplings and then some power law exponent that di dictates whether they decay with distance um, or perhaps grow with distance. Um, right? That's, those are all things I should be able to program in. So it turns out if you have this coupling structure and the, but the couplings decay with distance, you would get information sort of um, propagating linearly in time um, as in a spin chain. Um, but if you have this structure of couplings and they're flat with distance, then um, uh, you know, if I start with some excitation here and ask where it goes, things get, look much more complicated. Um, and it turns out um, that it's actually not, I don't have a good way of you know, solving this model um, uh, in a fully quantum system. But um, if one sort of asks in a semi-classical regime, um, what would be the scrambling time of the system in a, in a regime where one can do some calculations, it does, in fact, um, scale logarithmically with system size. And so this looks actually like a promising um, route to building a fast scrambler in the lab. One more neat thing about this is if, in fact, instead you had the interactions growing with distance, um, it turns out that you get um, the, the, the dynamics of the quantum system are best described not by thinking of the system as a linear chain, but by thinking of the sites of the system as nodes on some tree graph that effectively sort of describes how the, so the distance in the tree describes how long it would take for an excitation to get from one place to another. Um, and this is um, so this realization that that regime ought to be accessible by this scheme um, um, came out of a collaboration with Steve, Steve Gupser, who um, sort of who, uh, really pioneered a version of the AES CFT correspondence in which this tree can be thought of as really an explicit representation of a bulk geometry, which having a depth log n compared to the n sites at the base um, is effectively a, uh, a, a, a sort of a discretized version of a hyperbolic space. And so this could be an interesting toy model for having an explicit picture in our minds of what the bulk geometry is for the quantum system that we can build in the lab. So I've sh shown you that 
there are some interesting things you can do with these non-local interactions mediated by light. There are prospects um, for realizing uh, sort of SYK-like spin models, um, but also these tree-like models that show promise for exhibiting fast scrambling. There's one other physical system um, that we're working with in our, in our lab, which is an interesting potentially comparison where we don't have these highly non-local crazy interactions, um, but have actually sort of more natural local interactions. Um, you heard about a little bit already about Rydberg atoms today, um, but sort of we were excited. And so this is something that would be a way where one can have interactions that are mediated by some virtual excitation to Rydberg states instead of by virtual photons. Um, and kind of in, in, in thinking about that system, I never thought of it as the, the, the platform for quantum gravity in the lab until I heard about a recent um, proposal um, for studying the dynamics of a critical spin chain that has a time-dependent Hamiltonian in which the structure of the interactions varies between being constant as a function of distance, so the nearest neighbor interaction is, is constant as a function of distance, or um, where the overall strength of the Hamiltonian um, is modulated in a way that goes as sine squared. So it turns out if you can build this type of a model, you alternate between these two forms of interaction um, uh, periodically in time. Um, it's predicted that one has dynamics um, that you can sort of think of as quantum dynamics in a curved space, where in particular, one sees spin excitations get attracted to two points that you can think of as kind of singularities, uh, as black hole singularities. They're described by a Schwarzschild metric. Um, and why, okay, why do I put this up here? Um, I don't know if Chitra's in the audience. She's a theorist who, whose proposal this is. Um, when, it, when she told me this story, I, you know, she thought this is probably hard to realize experimentally. And we said, well, actually, it reminds us a lot of something we're doing in the lab, um, where we are um, optically controlling interactions um, we have a laser field that turns on the interaction. The strength of the interaction can vary spatially because the profile of the laser field varies spatially. It turns out that we're already doing things where we alternate between, in this case, interactions and a transverse field. Um, and uh, uh, OK, so here's a picture that happens to look a lot like the one in the theory paper. It's showing something slightly different, where we're looking at uh, uh, dynamics of a transverse field Ising model and uh, seeing a spatially dependent phase transition. Um, but uh, the tools are basically exactly the ones that one wants to start to explore that type of model. So this is a sort of a neat outlook that we learned about recently. Um, and um, I also sort of was intrigued in the last talk that these types of models we're building are a lot like um, what Stefan mentioned um, in terms of a driven Ising chain. So I think there are lots of exciting opportunities for taking the techniques um, of sort of this cold atom toolbox of optically controlled interactions. Um, be it in spin chains or what I focused on most of my talk, these sort of exotic non-local interactions um, to build um, toy models that you might have thought would sort of only be possible in theory land. I think we're starting to get to the point where we can start to build these models in the lab and um, have, uh, and, and so ultimately, perhaps even models that might look like this uh, tree representing anti dissider space. So um, I, with that, I will just uh, mention my group, um, particularly Emily Davis, um, uh, was the key person behind all of the cavity QED experiments. Um, the other names and pictures are here, and I will take questions.